Good morning, everybody. Here we go. Here we go. We got some good stuff today. I love that our church is like, we got a bake sale in the back, you know, and also we're going to get you to run. And while people are running, other people are going to be eating hot dogs. It's a total mixed message, actually. <laughs> but if you are going to run, please uh, consider like putting your efforts to work. Uh, we're trying to help girls that are rescued out of sex trafficking in Cambodia with the Morrison family. We love them, and we're uh, sticking up for them, uh, supporting them financially. And so uh, you can go to runforchickens.com, no joke, <laughs> to find out more. All right, we're in uh, Matthew 21 today. We're in Matthew 21, switching to a new series. Here we go. This is something Jesus said. What do you think? There's a man who had two sons. He went to the first and he said, son, go work today in the vineyard. No, I will not, he answered. A little later, he changed his mind and he went. And then the father went to the other son. He said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did what the father wanted? The first they answered. And Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. John came to show you the way of righteousness. And you didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you didn't repent and believe him. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to be the kind of people who enter into your kingdom, fully enjoying everything you have for us, fully trusting you. And uh, Lord, I pray that this message would be part of it. I pray it would be like Jesus came to teach us today how life works. Please, God, make us a church of, of responders, of, of, uh, of, of full engagement people, and, and help this message be a part of that. And, if anybody feels far away from you today, Lord, I pray that somehow uh, you would reach out to them. It would be like you're here connecting uh, them and you again. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> well, we are talking about our church and what we're trying to do. And I want to just refresh you here, like the whole big picture, what we're trying to do as a church. What we're trying to do is help people become mature Christians. We've got this little picture here that we have of, of the life cycle of a Christian. Uh, uh, a seed, a seed is basically a good little thing, but it's only a seed until it falls into the ground and dies. And there's a kind of a person who hasn't yet really died to themselves and given themselves over to Jesus. And we just think that's very understandable. That's the way everybody starts out. But the start of our faith is when we just say, look, I need God, I need Jesus. And so I, I kind of die to myself and kind of go into the ground like a seed and start to spring up. And a sapling is that kind of a believer that needs support. We all need support at one level, but in the early days, we really try to help uh, children and young believers. People are just kind of just taking the first steps, really growing. We, I love that little support thing that goes around the, the sapling that just says, look, we're here for you so that you grow well. And the ultimate idea for a believer is to fully mature. And maturity in Christ looks like Christ-likeness. And we picture that as a big tree. This is just a big tree, like that giant oak tree out in front of the church, you know. Just a big tree, provides shade for all. And then also a pattern of multiplication, which we say is the orchard stage. And so we've, we've talked a little bit. What does maturity look like? And I want to just refresh your idea about this. We are in a series all summer long. We're basically talking to you about what the goal is. How would we mature as Christians? If you feel like, hey, I'm just pretty new to this stuff, wh what are you trying to do? Well, how do you grow in Christ? All right, so let's talk a little bit about this tree. Okay, here's a little diagram. We think maturity looks like people who are rooted in the experience of God. They've given themselves over to God. They worship God. They, they, they carve out parts of their schedule to meet with God. There's, there's just an experience of the living God in their life, and that the, the very core of the whole thing is responding to His Spirit. God's Spirit is always leading us and empowering us, and we respond to God's Spirit. It's just essential for a believer to be responsive. If you just say, God, I know you're there. I'm not going to be affected by you at all. It's not much of a mature, it's not a picture of maturity, right? That's pretty immature to say, I know there's a God. I know somehow at the end it all works out, but I'm not going to shape my life based on that. That's not mature. We're, we're hoping everybody grows. They experience God and they respond to God. And then Christ-likeness, fruit in Christ, like becoming a person that's 
fully your personality, but also fully alive to God is a big part of it. And we, we think there's four parts to that here. There's Christ-like character, Christ-like actions, Christ-like relationships, and Christ-like thinking. And, and that's what we're talking about this summer. We, we spent the first uh, month in May, we were talking about Christ-like character. And now in June, we want to talk about Christ-like actions. What does it look like to live like Jesus lived, to do what Jesus did? That's what we're focusing on right now. Now, the first part is all about our character. We can't, we can't live out what we aren't. And we call it esse quam videre, this idea that we're trying to be rather than to seem anything. We're trying to actually be it. We're trying to be the thing. And what are we trying to be? Well, we're trying to be like Jesus. And that's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to grow us up fully human. Listen, you guys would all like to have lunch with Jesus. All your friends would like to have. Everybody would like Jesus, okay? There may be people in this world that aren't so hot about faith, but everybody would like Jesus. He's filled with love. He's filled with grace. If, 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 if your mechanic was like Jesus, you would really like that. He'd probably be good. He'd be honest. He'd be humble. He'd be for you and for the welfare of your vehicle, right? If your mechanic was like Jesus, you'd like that. If Jesus invited you out to lunch, you would like that. If, if the other guy's lawyer was like Jesus, you'd be glad, right? If we could just foster Christ-likeness in this world, that would be like the kingdom of God coming. It happens at the level of our character, and then it expresses itself in the level of our actions and the way we do relationships and the way we think about our life and everything. So let me, just, let me just review like our mission statement. What we're trying to do, we're trying to make disciples, helping people trust and become more like Jesus as they learn and follow him. And then as we do that, we're trying to be a reproducing church, like Amy said in the announcement earlier. We're, try, we're trying to share this around, okay? So on the one hand, we're trying to be like Jesus school. How do you learn how to be Jesus in the world, right? How, how would somebody learn how to be fully alive like Jesus was fully alive? And then we're trying to be the sharing size. You know sharing size, right? Like when you get the candy and there's your regular size, you know, and then there's the share size, right? The really great candy. It's, it's enough for you and enough to share around. Share size is great, isn't it? <laughs> share size is great. It's fun to share, right? And that's what our church is. We're, we're meant to share. We want to be like a, a kind of church that resources other churches and, and, and plants churches and starts campuses. And all around the Delaware Valley, then, people can uh, you know, benefit from anything that God has ever given us. Oh, look, sharing is happening right now. <laughs> Pass them all around. One M&M for everybody, okay? All right, let's take a look at this. Disciples learn from, trust, follow, and become more like Jesus. That is the whole thing we're trying to If you have no interest in this, you probably don't have interest in the church. I mean, we're going to just keep going at this. How can we become Christ-like? How can we push into this as we go along? Now, I want to just give you a little bit of wisdom from the brother of Jesus. There's a guy named James, one of the brothers of Jesus. It's pretty fascinating that, that we get to hear from somebody. If my brothers wrote, like, everything about Mark, it wouldn't be all positive, right? But <laughs> when Jesus' brother wrote about him, he said, look, one of the main things about the walk, about the way my brother was trying to teach was, you got to do it. You've got to pay attention. So let's look at, this is a passage from James, then we'll get to our main text today. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself. Remember last, last week there was that kind of idea like, it's possible to be self-deceived. Do you know anybody that's self-deceived? You know about them. Your friends know about them. Your wife knows about them. That person doesn't know about himself, right? And you know that person that just like doesn't have a clue about themselves? It's possible to be self-deceived. And James says, look, don't kid yourself. Do what the word says. Don't listen to it. Do it. Anybody who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says, like somebody who looks at his face in a mirror and then after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. And whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, but not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they'll be blessed in what they do. Here's the basic idea. Did you ever go into uh, the... Uh, the little changing room at Old Navy, right? What an evil place. What a terrible place. In there, the truth is told. 
I go in there and I try in some skinny jeans. I think maybe this, maybe this is the year. Maybe this is the year I'm going to just go for it because I want to be hip like all the musicians. I just, I just want, to, I want to go for it. And then I look at this mirror and this mirror tells me the truth. Oh, the truth is, don't wear these pants. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Back slowly out of this room without buying these pants. Now, James says, you look in a mirror and it tells you the truth, and if you don't respond, you're nuts. You're self-deceived. You're self-deceived if you don't respond to what the mirror tells you. And he says the Bible's like that. The Bible's a book that will be a mirror to you, that will show you who you are and what you look like, and you got to pay attention to that, right? Now, look, it might be affirming to you. You might be the kind of person who walks in and sees yourself in skinny jeans, and you go, yes. <laughs> well, let the mirror talk to you. Let the mirror talk to you. But really, you're like me, and some of you are. Don't buy those skinny jeans. <laughs> and if you have any doubt, look in the mirror. So that's what, the, that's what James says about this. Like anybody who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like somebody that looks at his face or his <laughs> whatever in the mirror and after it looks at himself, goes away, immediately forgets what he's like. Like, look, the mirror's for a reason. The word of God will show you who you are. It's a great book. It's an amazing book. The, here's, here's my honest thought about the Bible. I've been reading this book now uh, pretty much my whole life in, in response to like faithfulness to Christ for 37 years. I've been reading this book on and off, and I just can't get, I can't get past its value to me. Every time I read, if I get into a good Bible study with a group of people, if I'm sitting at my desk or something and reading, I'm sitting on a, on a dock looking out at the ocean or something like that, and I'm reading this book, it just reads me. And it changes me. And that's the way it's supposed to be. We, we can't be self-deceived. We've got to do what it says. We've got to, we've got to use this information and respond to it. And, and uh, James goes on to say, this is going to be f br uh, bring freedom to you. Look, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that brings freedom and continues in it. Like, the idea is this is to, this is to like sort of unshackle you from patterns. This, uh, this program that some of us are working on in the church called Faith Walking just uses this idea of first formation. Like, we've all been sort of formed in a certain way. And James says, look, you know, the, what God wants to do is unshackle you. He wants to sort of like get you free from things that limit who you are. Things that... Or not you at your best. There's a way that you can get free, and that's what James says about this. And then he also he closes by saying, if you do it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they'll be blessed in what they do. There'll, come, there'll be blessing that comes to you. Blessing that comes to you if you'll actually respond, if you change uh, in response to the mirror, in response to the word. If you actually say, like, look, I used to do it this way. I want to do it this way. Recently, I was at the funeral of um, Emily Costa's mother. Her name's Lillian uh, Cisneros. It was a beautiful, beautiful funeral. The kind of funeral that comes when somebody has lived a great life. You ever go to a funeral like that where you just go like, wow, because person after person would stand up and just say, this is, this is the way Lillian was to me. But one of the people said that Lillian would get up really early and, and seek God. She would read her Bible She'd let it be a mirror to her. And then she'd spend the rest of the day, after a very early start, the rest of her day blessing people. Uh, the rest of her day being Christ-like in this world. She was a huge uh, uh, model for the children, for her husband. It was the most beautiful tribute her husband gave to her. Right? And he's just, just, just the grief and the, the honor and the blessing and the hope he had. You know, it was just an amazing funeral, but it came uh, as the outworking of, of something like this. I don't know if you guys, you know, think, like, is, is there any benefit to doing this? Is, is it all sort of the same, like, just live by whatever rule, that whatever occurs to you, or whatever, whatever influences first influence you? The Bible says, no, there's, there's a thing God wants to do. He wants to form you. He wants to change you. But it'll require you doing it. You can't just hear that's self-deception. This really changes the way we think about Bible study, actually. I, 
I don't know about you, but I, I just, uh, you know, I, I have at times thought of it as an obligation. But the picture here is some freedom giving, a kind of adventure to look intently. He says, look intently. Recently, um, you guys know I'm a big fan of Dallas Willard. He's a philosophy uh, uh, professor at USC, and he's also written uh, extensively about uh, Christianity and faith and, and growing in Jesus. And uh, they, they showed a picture of Willard's Bible here. And it's, it, it's a picture, I don't know what you think when I see it, but I, I, I see a guy who has looked intently. Now, his most famous book was uh, The Divine Conspiracy, and it's all about Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, what, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Well, here's Willard's Bible uh, on Matthew 5, and all the notes that he'd written to himself, these teeny little scribblings and lines and connections. Here's a guy who's looking intently and then changing as a mirror reflects on his soul. I'm reading his biography right now. It's absolutely fascinating because he, always, he wasn't always the Dallas Willard that I met when in his older years. He was a young whippersnapper, kind of farmer, student, bad, not a great student. Here's one of the great philosophers of our age, and he was sort of a bad student when he was in school. It's really interesting. There's so much more. But over the years, the Lord changed him. And I I really want to put that into your mind as we go into the text for today. Let's look at this text here. It's a, it's a parable, Jesus said. This is like a story, but it's got a truth. And if you find yourself in the story, this truth will be a mirror for you. This truth will actually shape you. And so this is what uh, Jesus says. What do you think? There was a, a man who had two sons, and he went to the first, and he said, son, go to work today in the vineyard. It's like a family business, right? It's a picture of a family business here. This is just, just a man who has sons and they go to work together and it's supposed to be, the, and I'm sure that man has dreams for the business that it'll be a certain way. This week I was working in our garden out in the front of that house and because there's a big tree right next to it, the garden is filled with roots and it's really hard work and it was one of those humid nights this week. It was not like sort of terrarium weather this week and I'm out there working and sweating and the little guy next door comes over to to, to just check. Actually, I had my earbuds on and he came up behind me and he just stood behind me for apparently a long time because when I turned around, I was like, whoa, you know, he was, he was like, can I help? And I said, well, sure, you know, uh, uh, and here he is right now. This is Enzo. <laughs> he's my next door neighbor and uh, he's, he's helping me dig out a root right there and, and there's our dog Lucy helping us also. And But Enzo, Enzo was really fun to work with. He certainly lightened up my... Uh, he doubled my work, but lightened my spirit, right? <laughs> well, man, it was fun, you know? And I don't know about you, if you know this, but Barbara and I are expecting our first grandchild in, in the fall. We're excited about that. So now I'm like trying to do grandfather practice. Like, what would, what would it be like to be a granddad, you know? And I, I just think it's something like this. The story that we're told, the story of the way God wants to relate to people, the way he wants to relate to you is this, a father and son business. A, a daughter and son business, or a father and daughter business, right? Like this, like, I want to work with you. I want to work alongside. I want to empower you. I want to get you doing things that matter for the long haul. And we, we get twisted up about what even church is or what the Bible is or what God's up to. Like God wants us to obey a bunch of rules or do a bunch of stuff. What God wants to do is he's making everything new and he wants to make us a part of that. That's the kingdom of God. He's trying to make everything the way heaven is. He's trying to make everything the way it would be if he was fully in control. And he allows us to be a part of that. Now, um, one of the things that is a challenge when you're looking at a parable is to try to find yourself in the story. Where are you in the story? And there are people in the story. He's talking to religious leaders at the time here. And they're pretty, uh, they're, it, couldn't, it couldn't be missed that he's talking about them. Look, the Father's got his will. Do you ever wonder what the will of God is? The Father has his will. He's, he's got his will. And he says it to his son, go and work. He doesn't invite him to go into the, the uh, field at all. He doesn't, doesn't say, like, if you'd like to, you could go. No, it says this. There was a man who had two sons, and he went to the first. He said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. And that's the will of God. Come on. We've got a vineyard. This is our deal. Let's, let's, let's take care of it today. Let's invest in it. Let's see what the yield is. Let's make good grapes. 
Like, let's do this, guy. Let's go for it, right? And that's the will of God. It's not an offer. It's a command. Come on. And throughout the Bible, uh, Israel is pictured as the vine of God and the vineyard of God. And there's this, this kind of language comes up a, a lot, you know. And if we were in Northern California, it would really mean a little, lot more to us. We're not too used to vineyards around here. But the idea is it's like you are supposed to be the way I express myself in the world. And we work this stuff and you let me garden. You stay connected. All these uh, images uh, come up throughout the Bible. But then there is the will of the two sons, right? These, these kids, they got their will too. And so the first son says, look, I'm not going to go. Thank you for the offer, Dad, or whatever. No, I'm not doing it. I'm uh, playing a video game right now. Whatever he says, I'm not going to work. But he changes his mind then, and he goes to work. And then there's another guy who goes, I'll do it. And he doesn't do it. Now, I don't think it's that hard, especially if you're a parent in the room, to kind of like relate to these two things. And there must have been two other sons, too. I think there might have been two other sons. The one son who goes, I'll do it, and he did it. Right? You kind of hope that somebody on the planet is like that. Like, yes, I'll do it. And he does it. I hope somebody's like that. And then there's got to be that other kid who's real honest. Ain't doing it. Doesn't do it. Right? Okay, but we're talking about these two sons now. The one who says no and ends up doing it. And the one who says yes and ends up not doing it. And I guess you got to figure out, like, well, which one are you? Who am I? I'm the kind of person who wants to take pains to be thought of as the kind of yes person in the world, but I, I don't actually change. I don't actually do anything. Or may you be like me? Lots of people in the room. Like my first impulse is like, I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know. My first impulse is I came into like my later teen years was like, I, you're not going to get me into, I, I'm, not, I'm just going to live. But later on, I just thought, boy, I think I'd like to be part of this. I'd like to be part of the whole new making of the whole world. I'd like to be a part of this business, and I ended up doing it. There's people there in the room, these elders, these uh, priests and elders, and leaders of the faith, who knew that Jesus was referring to them. They thought of themselves as sort of the kind of people who mark themselves down, label themselves. I'm the kind of person who does what God wants. But what Jesus is saying, like, no, you're not. No, you're losing out. He says, you know, the kind of people that do what I want are actually these tax collectors and prostitutes. They're, they're entering into the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean they're going to heaven. It means God is doing something now. These people are, are just responding. They respond. Faith looks like this. Faith looks like action. They are responding. Their lives are changing. Zacchaeus was a tax collector who really ripped off his own townspeople. And when he repented, when he turned it all around, he started paying back, really overpaying back all that he'd done wrong. Around Jesus were people who were known to be prostitutes, who, for whatever reason, got to that desperate place in life where they think, like, you know what? I've got nothing left to sell except for my body. The only way I'm going to make it in the world is to sell myself. And these people found Jesus, offering something besides judgment, besides a list of all the sins they've done wrong, offering a chance to, to throw in with God. Jesus, just, just turn around from where you are and go. And what Jesus is saying to these, these leaders is, the tax collectors and the prostitutes get it. You've got to give everything up and just enter in with God. God's doing something new, and they're getting it. They're getting it right here. And this is a word of hope. This is a word of hope to anybody in the room who's ever got it wrong. Amen. It's a word of hope to anybody in the room who's ever got it like, I, no, I'm not, I'm not, no. There's still time for you. In fact, there's lots of pictures in the Bible of how God almost like specializes in using dysfunctional, broken people to do his grape growing. In a, uh, my small group, we started our small group a day early before June, so we got ours going already on Thursday night. And we were talking about um, Jacob, whose name gets changed to Israel. And then he has uh, 12 sons, and these sons become like the, 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 you know, all the 12 tribes come out of these sons. And we're just looking at these guys. What a messed up family. 
absolute look if you just want to look look in like thir- chapter like 34 35 of Genesis if you just want to see a messed up dysfunctional family with a kind of a passive dad and kind of like over sexualized sons and violence when it wasn't really appropriate and anger and then then brother turning against brother like the whole family is like really messed up and God says, well, I'll use these guys to start my whole, my whole Israel. I'm just going to say, like, it's so broken. It's real hope for somebody that just goes, ah, I've already gone too far. I've done the wrong thing. Listen, God just says, come on and like, let's, start, let's, let's start a new kingdom here. Let's be part of this whole deal. That's the story of the Bible. And the only way it seems to miss out on that story is to say, I don't need this. I don't need this. I'm, I'm going just right. I don't care what that mirror says. These jeans look great. <laughs> right? I don't care what you say, God. I'm not going to spend lots of time looking intently into your word. I'm not going to spend any energy thinking, is that me? Or is he talking about somebody else? Jesus is talking to people here, and he's offering them hope. He offers them several points of hope. Um, like this. He says, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom ahead of you. It seems to me like there's still time for them to enter the kingdom. It seems like he's saying, you might not enter the kingdom, but they're entering ahead. It's like, guys, there's still time for you. If you are the most religious, Bible-knowing person in the world, if you turn around and participate, if you let the mirror adjust you, you can enter too. He says that's why John came along. John came along to show you the way of righteousness. There, were, there was a prophet sent into the world, and, and prophets are sent into your life all the time. People who know something about the real way God works and what he's offering. Every once in a while, maybe even me, right? I say something and you should respond, right? There's a man sent to show you the way of righteousness. There's a whole, but you're gonna have to turn away. If you just gotta admit that mirror is showing me, I'm not on that path. And the people who are most likely, or at least, uh, you know, functionally, again and again, not on the path in Jesus' story, were religious people. It is so possible to deceive yourself by saying, I know verses. I go to church. And to miss being like Jesus. To miss working in the field with the one son who said yes and did yes. The call to us is response, is to action, to be made a certain way like Jesus, but then to join him in this amazing kind of work that he's doing where all things are made new and he works with sinners like you and me. Again and again, this this story comes up. uh, And even after you saw this, you didn't repent and believe. He's not saying this to judge these guys. He's saying it. The door is still open, guys. What God is doing now, you can be a part of. And folks, everybody in this room, what God is doing now, you can still be a part of. I don't care what's gone on before this morning. You can be a part of it. The only way to miss it is to say, I don't need any adjustment. Thank you very much, Jesus. This parable is about somebody else. I'm going to give you a couple things to try as we walk away from this. One, I would just... Uh, get you to think about Jesus' question. What do you think? That's how this whole thing starts out. What do you think? What are you thinking? What are you thinking right now? You know, what do you think is going on here? Do you think that some story Jesus told 2,000 years has any relevance in your life at all? Might you just even just be encouraged, like, hey, I'm just like a tax collector that turned around. And be encouraged that Jesus really receives that. You are entered into the kingdom of God. And here's the deal. Find yourself in this story. You can find yourself, if you've said no, every day of your life up until Jesus, just this minute. There's a, there's a time for you to turn around. Repent just means turn all the way around. And let change your mind so much that you start walking in a different direction. Like, just flip it around. You've been thinking one thing is the way to get it right and it's time to turn around. Jesus is talking to some of you, right? Find yourself in this story. You could be the kind of person who goes, I go to church every week. Well, 
those are the exact people that Jesus was trying to get to turn. He was pointing out that the tax collectors and prostitutes were already getting it right. And then I'll do this. Just, just because the whole thing is about matching up your words and your actions, like what you say you're trying to do, like these leaders say, we're, we are trying to represent God in this world, but their actions were nothing like the heart of our gracious you know, father who's making a new family characterized by absolute resurrection newness. So, so I would just say this. Learn how to get your mouth and your feet going in the same direction. The label that's on you, the way you think of yourself, get it all together. Get it all together. And it's a real art. It's a real art. We're going to spend the whole month talking about how do we live, right? And so it's a real art to like even get a right thought. Like I, I'd like to, uh, I don't know, I'd like to be more forgiving or more patient. I'd like to have some moments of my life that where I really do look intently into the Bible to sort of see if there's any me in there that I could kind of adjust, right? And to actually do it then is a whole different thing. In fact, Paul says at one point, he says this, he goes, I don't even know, like the things I want to do, I don't do, the things I don't want to do, I do. Like it's, it's, it's kind of a, an art, it's like a lifelong skill to learn how to get yourself going in the same direction that you even intend to go. But the Lord will help you. But I just, I would just start with this. Tell somebody what you're trying to do and then see how it goes. Just do it. You know, like uh, this week, you know, this is the thing I've been working on recently. I've been working on this. I'm trying to get places five minutes before things start. <laughs> it's like a lifelong journey. Like, I mean, I, it happened a couple times. <laughs> yeah, it's like a miracle, right? But you know, tell somebody, I'm trying to do this. The, the, the mirror showed me this, and so I'm trying to respond in this way. And lastly, just figure out if that's hard for you, why it's hard for you, okay? Maybe pray about it or something like that, because there's, there's things that need to happen, but the, the law, the perfect law, it brings freedom. It'll help you out, okay? Why don't you stand up? We'll pray together. We'll take communion.